Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I've got a very special guest for you, Dr. Shervin Molayam, uh, joining us all the way from Hollywood, California. And we're here to talk about the mouth-body connection, something that I'm very passionate about. But Dr. Malayam is a specialist periodontist, and he's going to give us a very unique uh, perspective on how to understand what we're seeing in the mouth in terms of inflammation and what it can potentially connect to in terms of something that's very topical, uh, viral uh, infections and other is chronic issues in the body. Dr. Malayam, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Dr. Lin. Yeah, I appreciate you, the time. You know, obviously, because you, you're a specialist periodontist, so your your um, your clinic is obviously very busy there in Hollywood. But you know, you've recently authored a paper, the mouth COVID connection, which we're going to dive into. But I kind of wanted to jump into a little bit into your background, you know, into how you got an interest into uh, becoming a periodontist and, and gums. Like, like, take us into that a little bit. Yeah. Well, uh, first, I just wanted to uh, say uh, thanks for having me. But not only that. Uh, I've been following you for uh, the last uh, year or so, and I just want to say, honestly, your content is amazing. I'm sure everyone else feels that, that way, uh, but, uh, you know, the lay person, I would assume, appreciates it, but also a lot of dentists uh, probably do as well, because a lot of what you teach and explain aren't taught in school, in dental school, so uh, I personally learn from you myself, and it's, it's, a, it's a great treat. Thanks. Well, I really appreciate you saying yeah. that. Yeah. And, and it's, it's an honor to have someone of your qualifications here speaking. And I just want to kind of really let the audience know, you know, that, that people like yourself are very highly trained. So to, to kind of hear that people like yourself are going further to further educate yourself is a big thing. And so these kind of t conversations, I just think are so important. So, you know, I want to thank you very much yeah. for your time. And, and I really, I'm really excited to dive into your work. Yeah. So uh, I'm a periodontist, which means I specialize in the gums, in the bone, around the teeth, uh, but overall health as well. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, the bacteria in the mouth doesn't just stay there. It spreads throughout the body, as you know. So um, in Los Angeles, we have a lot of, you know, celebrities, aesthetic people who are into functional and, and holistic dentistry. And uh, so that's been going on for years, actually, in, in Los Angeles. Um, it's become popular around the world now, um, but it, we've always kind of had these patients who are, you know, oil pulling and, uh, you know, talking about what we thought as dentists, more of uh, these outrageous ideas, only to now see that a lot of it and most of it is actually true. It's interesting, isn't it, you know, that, you know, with someone with such, you know, such, such deep training as yourself that, you know, we learn a lot from our patients, right? And, you know, I imagine, so in your practice, it's kind of, you know, your perspective has changed a bit. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, about how, you know, maybe, you know, things, how you used to see, um, you know, periodontal issues earlier in your career and then how, you know, certain things have taught you throughout, um, th throughout the, your times of seeing patients? Yeah. So when I was in my training, when we read an article, you know, Journal of Periodontology and different uh, journals. When they would talk about, uh, like, for example, um, uh, oil pulling, let's just use that as an example because we just spoke about it, it would be brushed over. We would talk about it as in um, the sense of it might be slightly better but not very much different. And, you know, so it was never pushed and it was always kind of laughed about. Like, oh, okay, just no. You know, so we never really went into it. As a, you know, and so I graduate. Uh, as a specialist in the gums and not really having a full control over a lot of this stuff. Uh, so uh, the schooling system and the, the universities and the textbooks, they are, they're not focused exactly on natural remedies and things like that, as you know. Yeah. And there's kind of a reason for that, right? Because, you know, in, in periodontics, especially like there's a heavy reliance on evidence, right? And like, as practitioners, we have to we have to be based in evidence, and that's very much where um, you know clinicians and treatments our minds are faced. But as you say, there's this disconnect. There's this you know there there isn't a world outside what you know general practitioners being taught, and that a lot of it is you know based in in you know different types of evidence that we um, you know aren't necessarily taught in school. So I think that's what you're kind of describing there, right? That you know there's a bit yeah. of disconnect there. 
Yeah, that and also uh, there's a lot of research that shows that, for example, uh, in certain industries, like in medicine, that uh, when they took uh, a, a certain articles and they look at the, the cohorts, cohort studies and they, and they compare it to articles that were funded by a certain um, you know, company that has a financial interest in it, they find that the studies that are funded show a five more or four more time more favorability for that particular thing that they're studying. So uh, it makes you think, you know, it makes you wonder, you know, is the research that I'm reading on a consistent basis in these journals, is it all 100% true or not? Yeah, and especially in dental as well, where it has, been, you know, a lot of the research has been directed by companies that do have, you know, products and so forth. So, you know, I mean, as you know, when we're appraising things scientifically, we always have to look at, um, you know, whether there are financial, you know, vested interests, don't we? And yeah. it unfortunately is is a reality. You know, um, education is, institutions and you know, researchers abroad is reliant on money and. You know, we have to be careful of where our biases come in there. So absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Malay, you know, you're, you're a Hollywood periodontist, you know, and, you know, you're treating one of the most co common chronic diseases in the world. Um, you know, describe to us a little bit in your, your day in, day out practice, what, what you see, what you do, you know, because, you know, a lot of your work, you know, you do quite technical and quite, um, you know, quite in-depth surgery on, on people's gums and, and periodontum. So yeah. describe to us a little bit about, you know, your your day-to-day -day work and what you see in the practice and, and what people are suffering. Yeah. So in general, periodontal disease usually happens in elderly patients. It really kicks into high gear at the starting at about the age of 35. So I'm ma mainly seeing people in their 40s, 50s. We do see people, you know, teenagers, they can have a certain strain of bacteria that occurs you know during puberty or in their 20s um, there's also some drugs that you know have side effects that can um, inflame the gums and make them you know out of control and bleeding um, so we see a little bit of everything uh, as far as uh, you know patients we don't see obviously too many kids babies and in, in that aspect of it um, I travel to different offices different cities and so I will see like the worst of every community, you know, I'm um, dealing with, uh, you know, a lot of people with bone loss, uh, people who um, are, uh, you know, want to keep their teeth, people who have bad breath, uh, people who have lots of um, uh, bleeding. So especially during the pandemic, there's, you know, offices that have been closed for a while. When they opened up, there was a backlog of all these patients. Hygienists were hard to get a hold of and slow to come back. Uh, so it's been right now. I've been noticing people's mouths are definitely a little bit dirtier than you know usual. A lot of my old surgery cases that were maintaining, I've seen them come back with more uh, deeper pockets than before. Sure, and and you know the it, I've noticed the same thing actually that this time where we've been disconnected from um, our health services and you know you know obviously stress plays a big part too that yeah. you know. It, people have, have definitely noticed a, and they've felt kind of a, um, a bigger burden on, on their gums and teeth. Just for the for those listening that um, you know want to describe, you know maybe hear a, a closer understanding of what gum disease is. Yeah. How do you describe, say, the the earlier um, stages of 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 bleeding gums and how that progresses on to, onto gum disease and what people should be looking for in their mouth? Yeah. Great question. So I always want to start with the basics. And a lot, I realize that a lot of patients and people don't know, for example, that a tooth is held in their, you know, their skull really by their jaw bones. You have the maxillary jawbone and the mandibular jawbone. These teeth um, also have a layer of gum around it. And you can get this, you know, this bacteria that can leak really, you know, not only the bacteria leak, but they can release toxins that leak. And they go through the gum and into the bone, the top layer of the bone, think of the bone like wood, very porous, and think of those toxins like termites. And they'll kind of go in slowly, seep through and soften it. And basically that's what's called you know, periodontitis or an inflammation or infection of the bone. That's really what we want to you know, stop because when it gets into the gums, the top layer, it's reversible still. 
that's puffy gums. You can get bleeding gums. But once it passes, usually passes the four and a half millimeter mark. Once you get into the five millimeter mark, that's when it's really off of the races and they'll just spread. And not only that, that's where a lot of the blood supply is. So we have a lot of blood vessels in the gums and in the bone. And that's how that bacteria and toxins get spread. And literally one minute is all it takes for bacteria in the, the blood really in the mouth to reach the foot. And in one dirty surface of one tooth, you have a, over 100 million bacteria. So it's a, it's a lot of bacteria entering the body. And as you know, not all bacteria are bad. But some, some bacteria are good. And it's the really the bad periodontal pathogens that we're really interested in getting rid of. What would you say, because, it, you know, you describe a, a very, you know, permeable, you know, communication between the mouth and the rest of the body, right? And this is, you know, kind of where, um, you know, a lot of the literature speaks to, you know, between the connection between uh, periodontal disease and systemic issues, you know, which we'll talk about in terms of re respiratory issues, um, but also heart disease, um, type 2 diabetes. But the, um, what would you say is some of the, the primary risk factors for people that have ginger bites? Because, you know, it's, it's up to 90% of people that have, you know, um, you know, gingivitis in some form. Uh, but what are some of the factors that makes this progress? So is it just the buildup of, um, of plaque? So you have plaque that builds up to start with, then what causes that to become a pathogenic, yeah. uh, you know, process? So, uh, plaque is basically, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you have some white stuff there and you scrape it off, it comes off that white stuff. That, that's the plaque and that has a lot of bacteria good and bad in there when that calcifies and when it hardens and when it gets in between the teeth and hard to remove that's when it will start accumulating so you have this community of bacteria then it'll start piling up on on each other and that's the best time to clean it because with floss with uh with you know brushing and flossing and water picking you that's how you get rid of it um when it calcifies, it gets harder to get rid of it. You have to think of it like a like a like you're washing a car. If you only have a strong hose, then, you know, it, you could only do so much, right? If you get in there and you scrape it and you, and you, and you, when you're wiping it, then it'll come off eventually. So that's what the, the floss does. That's what the hygienist does, okay? So, yeah, so basically when that seeps through and goes a little bit deeper, that's when it gets into the bloodstream. And do you think there's, there's connections between systemic issues and, um, and so susceptibilities? So, because we know these plaques sit on, you know, so bacteria live in our mouth, the oral microbiome, you know, we've, we've learned that in the last 10 years. So do you think there's susceptibilities in the person or, you know, uh, comorbidities that increase their risk of these, of these oral bacteria, you know, causing further disease? Great question. Yes. So, Basically, there are alleles. We have the certain genetics and alleles for certain, um, uh, you know, uh, even cytokines like IL-6, which we'll talk about, TNF-alpha, IL-1. These are these are our body's response to certain intruders, so to speak. Certain people, and you can do a salivary test, spit into something, send it to a lab. They can check to see your susceptibility and to see if you're high risk, medium risk, or low risk. And so knowing that, you could know if, if for example, if something comes at you, what's your response gonna be like? And that actually gives people some more power because if you're a high risk, then that, you may wanna be a person, an elderly and obese and diabetic. And so it's another piece of the puzzle that gives you information to be more careful when you're out and about. If, you're, if you have low susceptibility to some of these then you can be a little bit more carefree and, and probably get away with it because your body won't be overreactive. Yeah, you definitely see people that, you know, haven't really touched, you know, a, a piece of floss or um, a toothbrush in a long time, yet they don't seem to have the progression of disease that certain people do. So there's definitely this genetic susceptibilities. Can, yeah. can you describe for people out there that are wondering, um, can you describe what these tests are and, and what they look at and, and what some of them yeah, are? Yeah, if, if I can share my screen. Yeah, I will sure. show. Um, I have a great uh, thing that will picture illustration. Are you able to see that? 
So I just can't see that. You just have to press share screen on your. Okay. All right. Uh, You're like getting the notification. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yep. There we go. Right. Okay. Okay. So basically, this is the report that the sample report, for example, it will let the practitioner know exactly which bad bacteria is in their mouth at what <laughs> levels. So that line that you see on each of these colors, that's the, the threshold, the, the therapeutic threshold of where it starts to become, harm really the body. And that AA, that first one is a really bad one. Uh, that can cause really fast and destructive bone loss. And for example, TF and TD and FN, uh, these have been linked to, uh, for example, cancer, and in pain, some of the worst cancers, pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer, colon, lung cancer, um, also TD, TF, FN, um, have been linked to heart attacks and strokes. So uh, we can find out, and I, and I do this test a lot, which types of bacteria we have, which species, and what quantities. And at times, they'll recommend even... Um, an antibiotic uh, regimen for for that particular uh, patient. So they'll say, you know, um, uh, you know, take amoxicillin, a, a metronidazole, different antibiotics for that particular bacteria. And so this is an oral DNA report by my periopath, right? Yes. And and how 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 common is it for periodontists to use, or you know, even dentists in general to use these kind of tests? Yeah, it's becoming more popular. Um, it's still really underutilized. Uh, I think anyone that has some sort of gum problem should be, uh, you know, uh, having this done because even someone that has just like a one or two, five millimeter pockets will, will do this. In some of my offices, we do it routinely and we'll find out that they need to take a, this specific antibiotic and they, or they have PG, which has been linked to Alzheimer's, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, there's certain bacteria that can, if they're, uh, uh, pregnant, it can cross the placenta and lead to uh, premature births and lower birth weights. Yeah, the the we, we, because the literature on the connection between you know periodontal disease and systemic um, links has been around for a while now. But what you're kind of showing us is we're actually we're starting to see the the direct connections on how we can measure you know, risk factors for, you know, genetic markers in the mouth and then, you know, how this translates to disease processes throughout the body. Yeah. It's a fascinating way, you know, and, and I think, you know, oral DNA saliva tests is really probably one of the, the most powerful future markers we'll have of, of our health because you know, you've just described the connection between, you know, a periodontal pathogen and an Alzheimer's disease, which, which is starting to become a bit more known. And, the um, you know, neurologists are talking about this more and more now. So they say, hang on, we yeah. find this this bacteria in the mouth, yet we you know we, we have the ability to be able to kind of mitigate and prevent this. You yeah. know, you've mentioned antibiotics a little bit. Just as a um, you know as 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 a periodontist, where do you see the application of um, of, of antibiotics in periodontal disease? So. There is a couple. There, there's a lot of studies that show a low dose for an uh, extended period of time. You know, you can go like anywhere from three to six months even of just a low dose tetracycline, uh, even, um, you know, uh, amoxicillin. And it can, it can decrease inflammation and, and help keep some of these bacteria under, uh, you know, under that threshold. Um, we usually give it in, in acute situations where there is pus, there is an infection, there is a root canal, you know, teeth that's, you know, causing an issue. Um, that's usually where we see it with, the, the, the problem with antibiotics is that it also, when you don't get rid of the actual bad bacteria, they become resistant. And you're not only, what happens is these bacteria, they accumulate, imagine like this ball. And the bad bacteria go in the middle the weak bacteria go on the outside and antibiotics only get to the area where blood supply reaches. So 
if there's a cyst, if there's this you know, bacteria and infection, they form this colony together and this back antibiotic comes and it can only get to the outside, the bad the, the weak bacteria die. The strong ones, which compete with the weak ones, survive, reproduce, and this thing only gets stronger and worse. So that's the, you know, if 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 you're not gonna come and wipe it out, the bad bacteria, they do start to resist and become stronger. So we have to worry about that as well. Yeah, so I mean, you basically described it. So in in severe infections, it, it can help clinically, but you know, f for the most part, there are um, you know there are limitations and also potential side effects too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The um, it so for I, I find it really interesting, you know, because periodontists, you know, really kind of dive into the details of this. But um, and something that we've really learned in the last you know ten years is the the, the connection to our gut and how our immune system um you know really interplays with bacteria which is such a fascinating um you know kind of connection when we consider how we've looked at at dental plaque and and you know basically just cleaning off but there's actually this big connection between these things but periodontists yeah. have been understanding this you know response how immune responses change in the mouth you know for for decades and, and dental has been a little bit like this where we've been ahead right yeah. um, can you describe some of the immune responses that change um, in the mouth when periodontis happens. So, because the, we see the different types of cells and the different, um, approaches that the body takes. And then this really starts to, to become chronic disease. Yeah. So, uh, I may want to just, just so the viewers can see, uh, get a visual of it. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen and just kind of just show a picture again, if you want to. Sure. Yeah, because I think this is really interesting because the we're talking about these these um, immune reactions in the gut, yet uh, we have a much more measurable um, way of seeing this happen in the mouth. Yeah. So let me pull it up. And this this is from a presentation I, I created based on a publication uh, that I came out with. Uh, that's in the October issue of the uh, California Journal of uh, uh, the, the California Journal Association. So basically, dental association. So basically, we have uh, in a systemic inflammation. Uh, you know, this is how really it happens. You have a healthy tooth here on the left, and in a, on the left side, the body is able to fight it. And, and you, you can create a balance by, you know, neutrophils and certain just uh, innate uh, ability uh, to uh, protect the body uh, and good hygiene, really flossing, brushing uh, and, and water picking, getting to cleaning every, you know, th three to six months, depending on the person. Um, when you have disease, you have these local cytokines. So you have all these bad bacteria uh, causing bad proteins to be released. That's what cytokines are. They're in inflammatory proteins. And so that gets released into the blood vessels, into the bone, and from there it spreads. So this is kind of the mechanism of, of how uh, things happen. Um, and that can be sent in many ways into the body. It can be aspirated and you can, you can uh, uh, let me stop sharing. You can, are you able to see me again? Yep. Okay. So you can literally, you can inhale the saliva and bacteria into your lungs. You can swallow, which we swallow many, 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 many times a day, and you're getting bacteria going into the stomach. And so, uh, and, and through the bloodstream, you have bacteremia, you have uh, toxins being released, you have this cascade of cytokines being released. The body is really, uh, especially nowadays, we really everyone's being, paying more attention to all of this, but it's always been there. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to think that, you know, these are mechanisms that have been known for quite some time now, you know, probably, you know, getting close to 30, 40 years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, yet we're only kind of just starting to dawn as a, hang on, this stuff's really important. You know, these bacteria, these inflammatory medias, they, they really sit underlying in, in most chronic um, issues. Um, and, you know, the, the description, one of the biggest connections we've had with um, is the risk of infective endocarditis, right? 
Um, can yeah. you describe that and, and what happens? Because that, that's something that, you know, most dental practitioners, uh, well, all the dental practitioners have known and practice about in terms of antibiotic prophylaxis. But can you describe what happens in that? Because it, it's, it helps us to, to see what happens in, in other chronic diseases. Yeah, so the really the, the bacteria that, that are released, uh, they, uh, get, they spread throughout the body and they get into the arteries. And, uh, and, I, and what happens is these uh, toxins and the bacteria, they signal uh, these endothelial cells and, um, uh, and they travel. One, one of them, they, tra they travel into the, you know, the valves of the, of the heart, for example. So that can cause a, you know, if you have a fake or, you know, a prosthetic valve, it can cause an infection there and lead to, you know, endocarditis and, and you know, a lot of other issues. So cardiologists right now are looking at that more. We're getting more referrals from them. Um, and I wanted to tell you that the, the medical community um, is, they know a lot of this, but uh I don't get, and I'm not seeing as many referrals from the medical community about these types of things. And that's a little bit strange because the, the connection between, you know, the dirtiest part of the body is, is the mouth and then in the gut. And this is the gateway of where, how bacteria enters. And so um, you would think that doctors and medical doctors should be probing, maybe even, you know, um, looking more in, into the gums and to seeing the condition because uh, remember, only 6% of periodontal disease patients actually feel any pain. So most of the time, it's, it's a silent disease, just like having a heart attack. The moments before, you don't really know. There's no pain or cancer. How things travel in a cancer, there's no pain most of the time. So yeah, totally agree. It, it, it works quite silently, doesn't it? And, you know, um, health professionals in general, it, it, it is such a simple test, isn't it? You're kind of saying that, hang on, so other medical professionals should maybe be doing very simple oral tests and yes. you know, they would probably say it's out of scope, but you know, I, I think it makes sense, right? It's, it's simple, you know, so it, there's probably, you know, I, I've thought about this for a while. There, there is probably a little bit of a um, responsibility of the dental community to educate other health professionals, how easy and how impactful this is, because say if a cardiologist can make a simple, um, you know, oral, uh, you know, oral bleeding test, you know, some kind of, um, to, to just gauge the risk of, um, or the level of periodontal disease, which they can do very simply, you know, they can make a referral to someone like yourself that can help mitigate much of the risk for, um, adverse, you know, reactions during their treatment. Yeah. So it makes yeah. so much sense. You know, I, I think that's a really important point in that yeah. I think, you know, health professionals in general, even, um, you know, uh, you know, people that are on, you know, other kind of um, health professionals too, you know, outside doctors and so forth should be looking a little bit more in the mouth. They may not necessarily doing anything, but you can see things, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's a very simple diagnostic tool. Yes. Um, Dr. Malayan, there's a couple of questions here before we get yeah. kicking into the COVID connection. I thought we'd just yeah. pull these in. Um, Gemma Evans asks, have you ever seen gum disease and inflammation as the root cause of perioral dermatitis on skin around the mouth? That's an interesting question. Have you, have you seen that in, in patients at all? Um, the actual connection between actual gum disease and dermatitis, no. Do you ever see it in, um, do you ever see patients uh, exhibiting any kind of dermatitis around the mouth? Or what, what about oral thrush? Do you see that at all? Yeah, we would see that a lot, yeah. Um, yeah. but but you know, as far as uh, um, you know, the bacteria getting in and then causing a reaction on on that area, um, it, it, and if it happens, it's extremely rare. But yeah, yeah. It's something that it, that we see on so, our so yeah. generally periodontal disease stays localized in the mouth; it doesn't spread to kind of issues yeah. around the mouth. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, it that's... stays in the blood, and it goes down this way, lungs, heart. Yeah. yeah. It goes into the body. It would be better if it went out, right? Because yeah, know, yeah, like a pimple. You know? yeah, yeah, right. True, oh. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And people probably wouldn't ignore it then. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's what an abscess is as well. An abscess is the you know the infection making its way out, like a pimple. Abscess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a good it's a good point. Okay, so uh, Glenda Ramirez asked a clinical question. She said, "How can we keep our periodontal patients uh, motivated to return for regular maintenance care when gums stop bleeding and all feels okay?" As as a practitioner, I do find this happening often, even though I've shared reasons to return. This is probably something that most dental practitioners would ask. 
Yeah. So I, as a doctor, dentist, periodontist, the most important thing that we do is we educate and teach by far. And uh, there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, one is visual. So we have to, you know, get a mirror in our patient's hands and show them in their mouth because they, no one ever really looks and it opens their mouth in the mirror and really looks to see what's going on. So by the chair with you narrating it with a mirror probe, showing them everything. So showing them what, what, what are their weakness areas? This is an area to look out for. Look, your particular anatomy and you know, you're a functional dentist. Functional means anatomy. It means that, for example, if they have a you know a tooth that's just tilted a little bit, that might let in more bacteria. So, for example, I had a patient like that the other day. I said, look, this tooth is perfectly straight. This one's straight. The one behind it is a little bit this way. That's why you have a six millimeter pocket in there. That's your weakness area. You're good everywhere else. Let's focus on that area. Get the floss in there. Da 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 da. So, um, visual. Um, yeah, on I, I agree floor, with that. The, um... You know, oral cameras has been such a big part of, you know, when patients see something in the mouth, for, for some reason, people don't look in their mouth, right? It's something you yeah. can kind of do in the mirror, but they just don't do it at home. So when they see it on a big screen in front of them, it, it change. you can see the, the important stuff to, to turn on. Right. So I yeah. think that's a great point yeah. talking to them about it and, and running through that, that, that really is, um, you know, the, get, getting the lights to turn on is, is how, is yeah. how you shift that patient's yeah. behavior, right? Yeah, when yeah. they see it on the, on themselves, they they own it. Yeah, the, absolutely. Okay, so let's look. That's, there's there's been a lot of talk. Um, you know, people generally know the risk between gum disease and and heart heart conditions. Uh, yet we still, as we've talked about, don't connect that. Um, you know, between um, you know, between healthcare professionals and you know, probably out in the community that bleeding gums does increase the risk of, of heart disease. But there is there is um, also a big connection between type 2 diabetes, which is one of the more common chronic um, diseases uh, in the world. What do you see? Do you see an increased prevalence in people with type 2 diabetes and um, more severe gum disease? Or, or w what do you, have you seen in your clinical practice as how this presents? Yeah. So uh, everything uh, that uh, is all related and linked, and it really, I, the way I like to explain it is it's like a, a freeway, right? And you have, everything is about blood flow. When you have this freeway, with, let's say five lanes, you have five lanes and one lane is smoking, one lane is diabetes, one lane is obesity and, you know, cholesterol, LDL. Um, so you have, you know, all these factors. When one of the lanes is clogged up and then another one gets clogged up, all of a sudden you have this accident over there and this ambulance wants to get through and they only have like three lanes to go through, but you have all these other cars in two of the lanes. So it's harder for things to flow to that accident. So uh, that's really how everything works. And if you want to make sure that you're healthy, you want to make sure all your freeway, all the lanes are open, flowing. You want to make sure your blood vessels, not only that, you want to make sure those lanes are big so you can have trucks come in, so to speak. And so uh, that's basically uh, dilation of the blood vessels. That has to do with nitric oxide. A lot of it is, uh, uh, which, which you've talked about before, uh, I know. And nitric oxide is what, it, you know, dilates the blood vessels. Uh, it was discovered actually a, a long time ago, but uh, revisited with Viagra, for, you know, and yeah, Louis sure. Pignaro. So yeah, that... Uh, it affects blood pressure, and we know that bacteria in the mouth affect ni the nitric oxide um, and th that whole connection. When you treat uh, the diabetes, you can get those numbers, uh, the A1C number lower, you can decrease blood pressure. So uh, one leads to the other, but treating one could also help the others too. That's something I think that, you know, because the, the amount of people out in the community suffering from peri um, type 2 diabetes, you know, the yeah. concurrent um, periodontal disease that occurs and then how these two feed each other, the the, it, the lowered immune system and the, the lack of healing response really seems to affect these patients. Yeah, it, it's it, like you say, it really is a, a multi-pronged um, input into the body that, you know, it, it, it is so much more effectively treated if we consider these things all connected. Absolutely. 
Okay, yeah. so but, uh, so we've talked about heart disease and type two diabetes. A lesser known connection between periodontal disease is b- between the the mouth and the lungs, and there has been a, a well known connection between chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and periodontal disease. Um, can you describe that in terms of what the literature says um, in terms of how this mouth lung connection, um, you know, starts, you know, tells us about this this link between our breathing and our gums. Yeah, so really, uh, like COPD uh, is associated with severe periodontitis and and bone loss, um, especially in males, actually. Uh, It's been shown to have a higher attachment loss, so deeper pockets in in these types of patients, um, and then higher inflammatory mediators, so you'll see a lot of inflammation. Um, Also, you'll see fewer teeth, so people have lost their teeth more in, in COPD patients. Um, and, and that's, you know, you have the aspiration of the bacteria into the lungs. You have the bacteria going through the blood vessels into the lungs. Um, uh, the release of like, for example, TNF alpha and, and IL-6 or interleukin-6 also, what it'll do is it'll decrease the ac- uh, oxygen uh, exchange in the alveoli of the lungs. So you have a lot of these direct links and indirect links. Um, also with pneumonia. So they've shown in uh, hospitalized patients, um, d- just by doing a, like a very deep cleaning and, and ex- or an extraction of a very bad tooth, you can help respiratory infections. Yeah, it, it's, it's funny. Actually, the, the, the connection between the mouth and the lungs, it really hasn't been that well Elicit and I only started to read papers about this probably the end of last year on the, the lung microbiome and you know how they how um you know respiratory physiologists show that the bacteria in the lung lose diversity as we start to get disease and it's so similar to what we see in the mouth right you see a an influx of um of pathog- pathogenic bacteria um the, you know the alveolar sacs start to um you know be overrun by 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 pathogenic bacteria, and then we, we lose the immune response. It's nearly identical to what we see, you know, disease process wise. And interestingly, you mentioned nitric oxide, the role of nitric oxide through, you know, the nasal sinus into the lungs. Yeah. And so it, it, it's fascinating, isn't it, that we haven't connected this, you know, this oral route of, um, of you know, connection to respir- respiratory disease. And then there's this connection also between the gut and the lungs, which is just, you know, the, it's really showing us how, impactful you know oral health can be so what the you 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 authored a paper recently the mouth covid connection um where did you there was a lot of literature in that so i I wanted to kind of dive into some of the studies that that show us risk factor for viral infections and um, periodontal disease and so so where did the literature leave you lead you to write this paper so the when this pandemic happened you know it, it was it was a shock to the world um, uh, and as a periodontist, we know that we're essentially uh, oral infectious uh, disease specialists in a way, and this is our training. So uh, that when the, you know you're hearing all these, seeing all these, you're at home, you're on your phone, you're on the computer, and you're seeing that there's you know all these cytokine storm and all this. It's like oh wow, you know the same thing that's happening in the body happens in the gums, and. I saw this one paper uh, out of Germany, and it showed something that really it really shaped uh, the the last seven eight months for me personally. Beautiful article, very simple, and it basically showed that when these COVID patients in hospitals, uh, they drew their blood, you know, when they arrived at the hospital, during, you know, when they went on a ventilator, or if they went on a ventilator, and they wanted to see what's going on in their body at those specific times, and they saw that. Almost every time when someone's interleukin-6 went above 80 picograms per milliliter, that's when people were going on a ventilator. When you go on a ventilator, only you know, 70%, of the, uh, 30% of the time you may live. So that's, that's how the pathway, you know, that's how people are dying. So I'm like, wow. And also CRP, C-reactive protein to a lesser degree, but it was a 22 times higher chance of being put on a ventilator being above 80. I mean, so um, so I looked at the literature and I went back and I said, how much IL-6 is released in, in, in the gums? Um, we saw, you know, 
just by doing a deep cleaning on a patient, you could lower it by five to 10 to 20, you know, and people can be walking around. You can go get your IL-6 levels checked, which is not a bad idea. You can also get your alleles checked, genetic testing to see if you're high risk, medium risk or low risk. I, I checked mine when I saw that. I was medium risk. So if I was high risk, I, you know, I would be wearing a thicker, better, uh, better mask maybe, or I stay home a little bit more. But so that really, that article started it. And, and from there, uh, I was really, uh, uh, you know, I teamed up with a, another periodontist who's a PhD. And we, we wrote this article that uh, uh, went viral, in fact, uh, and really uh, um, we're happy to be able to help people during that time. Yeah, it went viral in a good way. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it, it's a great article, you know, and you can see that, you know, it, it makes so much sense, you know, like someone like that, you're exactly right. You know, you guys deal with these kind of, you know, conditions all the time, inflammatory issues and where the body isn't responding well um, to, to, a, to a viral load. Um, can you describe a little bit to, you know, for people in periodontal disease, what have they shown in the literature in terms of um, viral infections in the mouth? And you know, because there's, we mentioned thrush, but so how is, how is that um, shown out in the pathogenesis of, of periodontal disease? Yeah, so we have a lot of viruses actually in the mouth. We have uh, cytomegalovirus, we have herpes virus. Um, and these bacteria, they, sorry, these viruses actually may work in conjunction with bacteria. So, for example, in uh, certain bacteria like AA, uh, they work along the sides, some of these viruses. And um, when we're stressed out, for example, um, these uh, viruses will hang out in a nerve and they can get triggered. So that's why you'll see on certain patients, you'll see symmetry. You'll see uh, the front part of the first molar here, the front part of the first molar there, and it's symmetric. It's because there's a viral component to it and it is all part of the, you know, that trigeminal nerve and it can trigger that response that goes to both sides. You see, just to clarify that you mean in terms of periodontal disease in the same pocket and the same tooth on, on, on opposite sides, is that what you yeah. mean? Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. The, um, because it, it makes sense in terms of the, the feedback between, um, you know, because they show now that bacteria and, and microbes communicate through the nerves to the brain. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about the, um, porphyrmonas ginger, gingivitis, uh, and Alzheimer's disease, yeah. uh, but also, so you we know that herpes travels through the, through the nerves. And then, so you're showing that there's a, um, there's a, there's a connection here between bacteria that or microbes that are running up and down the nerves and eliciting a, or maybe reducing an immune response in the, um, you know, with certain teeth. So that, that's really fascinating and the connection and how there's a role of viruses in the body. So how would you say this is um, this, this balance, you know, potentially when, when, when it, goes out of whack increases our risk of um of potential viral infections and we know that this can be a risk of respiratory as well so what did your paper show sure so we know that uh, viruses and bacteria they actually compete with each other they're they're competitive and uh especially with uh, aa there's that that one i showed um it has a really long name aa is an abbreviation that one uh, works in conjunction with uh, uh, certain uh, on on the nerve, and we see a very quick uh, amount of you know quick bone loss, fast bone bone loss, destructive bone loss, and it can get triggered by like stress, for example. So that's why when we see during stressful times, uh, you know, all of a sudden people are losing more bone, it has to do with that viral bacterial mechanism that that is going on as well. Yeah, and, and it makes it, it it's fascinating to think that we have you know viruses living in the body normally too. So they're thinking that way. To say it quite clearly, um, Glenda asks, does it mean that if we we are more prone to COVID nineteen if we had periodontal disease? Would you say that straight? So, um, so the the question is, um, so we're not more prone to it. That we we are uh, we can get it the same amount if we have it or not our reaction is different though uh so our, our our 
mouths when this, when this uh, COVID, because remember, COVID is coming in the throat, uh, nose in the throat, and it's coming down this way. So uh, very much, a, you know, uh, an oral uh, infection as well. Um, when that happens, when you, your local cytokine, it could storm more if you have periodontal disease. So you're at a higher IL-6 to begin with. Remember, if you're ab at above 80, you're on a ventilator pretty much. So if you're starting out with like 15 or 20 and then you get COVID, it's easier to get to the 80 than if you're starting out with three or four or five. So it's all about if you want to live in this time, like really there's like a formula. You want to keep inflammation down. That's it. Um, and it's like a fire. COVID is a fire. And we, our body is the tinder. We want to make sure that we have less tinder for this fire to take off on it. So um, you want to have anti-inflammatory foods. Um, uh, in particular, what increases IL-6 is uh, processed sugars, refined carbs, um, certain meats. Um, you want to have anti-inflammatory uh, like turmeric, uh, ginger, garlic, uh, a lot of things that just will decrease inflammation. That's why steroids are one of the most effective in treating COVID because COVID is an anti, uh, uh, steroids are anti-inflammatory. Just, just on that, have you seen any steroid treatment in peri periodontal diseases? Have, have you seen any application of that? Good question. Uh, yes. Uh, but um, it's, it's not it's not as popular also because uh, it's, it's, it's you know short term so especially after a surgery we'll give a steroid um, better healing but if you you know long term steroids uh, it could decrease you know your your, your immune system um, and lower the immune response you know long term so we don't do too much long term periodontal disease steroids it's more post surgery sure it makes sense I, I know it um an orthodontist I think it's a Brazilian Brazilian orthodontist, and he talks about steroids a lot, and and how in terms of treatment of moving teeth, and it's fascinating. I, I, it just made me think that you know you brought up the you know, um, the use of steroids in 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 uh, inflammatory conditions. So look, you you mentioned the the testing. So it, it's it's a great um, you know statement that you know our own susceptibility to conditions and chronic disease will make our um, you know risk for. Uh, you know, worse response to certain conditions, viral infections and so forth. Um, you know, the, the comorbidities and risk of these respiratory infections are well known. You know, how do you think that, you know, we can better integrate, um, you know, oral, oral diagnosis? You know, we've talked about other health professionals. We've talked about, um, you know, better awareness amongst patients. But like as a as a periodontist, you, know, you see this every day. So how would you say that we as a society can start to, you know, better mitigate our or understand our risks through oral disease in terms of, you know, our um, management of things like viral pandemics and so forth? How, how does this picture you know, change the future in your opinion? Yeah. So I think we're looking more now at taking the vitamins every day. Um, you know, vitamin, all, all those fat soluble light vitamins, you have the vitamin A, D, E, K, um, you, you talk about them so well in your, in your posts, uh, but they have also a role in, you know, periodontal disease, some of them, and keeping inflammation down. Um, I think the future is going to be, you know, hopefully COVID kind of uh, starts to fade away, the strain. Um, in past pandemics, we've seen one wave and then another wave, and then it's usually gone. So I'm kind of hoping for that as right now we're looking to at this second wave pretty much in Europe. It's starting up. Um, and and uh, how, how is it in Australia right now? Oh, we're pretty good here. Yeah. yeah. It's um, you know, we really didn't get affected all that much. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's definitely, um, you know, but you know, it's a great message. You know, I think, you know, it, it's well known that people have, um, you know, risk factors and that if we, if we control our own health, then you know we, we really don't you know have to fear all that much right yeah um, yeah so like actually in your in your general treatment of yeah. periodontal disease do you recommend supplements to your patients i do um especially in the past year or two that i've been becoming more educated myself on it uh, i see that it's it's for example there's research coming out that shows that after replacement of dental implants you know taking vitamin d d3 in particular 
uh, helps with uh, success rate or uh, vitamin K or people who I see that have a lot of you know, tartar in their mouth. Um, you know, more towards certain uh, antiseptics, you know, less Paradex, less alcohol-based mouth rinses. Uh, that's been shown to even increase blood pressure. Um, so the, it's, things are changing in the mouth and, and uh, uh, there's definitely this movement that is, is happening and patients are demanding it really now and uh, you know, learning from people like you and getting educated on it, it's really amazing. Uh, that you know, from uh, from a uh, really from a social media and from a post, and you can really make a big difference in people's lives. So it's, it's amazing. Well, you know, you, you've 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 really helped to kind of elicit how important the the mouth body connection is with you know something so topical yet something so simple when we when we just understand the disease process from an oral perspective. You know, it, it's, it is fascinating to see, you know, a specialist like yourself, you know, really, you know, kind of, you know, learning so much and at the same time, but you're, you're, you're at the, you know, the cold face of this, you're, you're, um, you know, treating patients and you're, you know, helping people to kind of overcome. It's a very difficult issue, isn't it? Like periodontal disease is one of the, the hardest things you can you yeah. can explain to someone that they have, you know, yeah, right, yeah. You know in terms of oral disease, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think there's just for like a, a couple of tips I have uh, for for your viewers. Really, you want to as the older you get, also you don't want to wait every six months for a cleaning. I think the number of six months came from the insurance companies' financial books. That's what made sense for them. So you may be able to get away with it as a teenager, but once you really get into your 30s, you want to be at every four months or sometimes maybe every three months. The research shows that it takes three months for bacteria to come back and to start to cause problems. When people floss, you want to floss at least one to two times a day, um, brushing twice a day. You want to brush for two minutes. An electric toothbrush has been shown to be better than a manual, unless you know, unless you're young and you know you're really good at brushing, but you don't want to brush too hard. You want to get the the the, 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 the electric toothbrush and just kind of guide it in certain areas. What I see is a lot of gum recession also. Right-handed people get a lot of gum recession on the, le on the left side because they can generate more force in that er direction versus in this direction. Um, the sign of bleeding gums, it, it, gums don't spontaneously just bleed unless it's really bad. So you, sometimes people don't know their gums bleed because they're not flossing. So you have to floss to even find out if, if your gums bleed. And so I'll see a lot of people say, well, I don't floss because my gums bleed. You know, so that, that's, that's a problem. Um, and, uh, and really, uh, uh, bad breath is another one that, that is really important because we generally can't tell if we have bad breath because it's within us and we're used to it. But uh, and some spouses don't even tell each other. You know, so it's something that uh, as a practitioner, I will, you know, if I don't tell someone I smell bad breath, then who who else would be? So I think as dentists and and uh, it's our job to say you know I smell you know some bad breath. Bad breath is the bacteria and the it's very deep, usually in the top layer of the bone, that releases sulfur. Some of the bad breath is also on the tongue, so a tongue scraper is really important. Um, so those are some tips I have uh, uh, along with the water pick. Uh, it, it really helps keep the mouth clean. Ab absolutely, yeah. Bad breath is definitely one of those that are. It is difficult. Do you find in your clinic that most people, well, I mean, the people that come to you with bad breath complaints that they it resolves after periodontal treatment, or are, are there more persistent issues sometimes? Or sometimes it'll be persistent, but I would say maybe 80, 90 percent of the time it's from the, that deep bacteria. Sometimes I'll walk in a room. A pa you know, to treat, see a patient, and I can, and I already know, you know. Sometimes I'll even know which species of bacteria it is, uh, you know, because I, I, you know, seen so many, and then I'm doing a procedure and I'm smelling it. So, so imagine you, on the on the hundredth time you walk in the room and you're like, I don't even need it. You don't even need to send it to the lab. You know? <laughs> I, here's what antibiotic you need. Yeah, you've got your own lab uh, from from your nose to your brain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's great tips, you know, and like I, I feel that you know if if um, you know society could 
could become closer to you know our a self-diagnosis in the mouth and understanding what's happening with our oral health it, it really helps people to kind of mitigate a lot of risk for other conditions and then help uh, overcome as well so it, it's a great message um, your your paper, the mouth COVID connection, IL six levels in periodontal disease uh, and potential role in COVID nineteen related respiratory comp- complications. It's available at mouthcovid.com. Is that correct? Yes, that's the probably the quickest way to see it. Or you can go on the the, the uh, website of the, the journal, California Dental Association journal website. Um, I I, I just want to show one picture from that that summarizes everything. Um, sure, if- absolutely. So this basically, are you able to see? I'll just bring that up now. All right. So basically, this summarizes the article that we have many pathways to really get harmed by COVID, and we have a local stress, which is the inflammation from the gums, and the, again, the studies show if you have gum issues, if you're bleeding gums, just by doing a nice deep cleaning, you could lower that IL-6 or interleukin-6 in, in, the, in the whole body. You can lower it. You can lower CRP, C-reactive protein, which is another really bad one that's also been linked to a lot of autoimmune issues. You could lower that by 50%, 5-0. And so the, the way that they really get in the body, again, gets the bacteria goes in the bloodstream, which is the bacteremia. You can inhale the bacteria into the lungs or it gets into the bloodstream. Those also can you know, cause a, a, a gut dysbiosis. So uh, for example, like P. gingivalis, it, it could survive the, the acids in the stomach and, and cause a dysbiosis, therefore, and get into the bloodstream and, and, and cause problems in the lungs. Um, you have the endothelial dysfunction Endothelial dysfunction means that the cells that line the blood vessel, they can get altered by this IL-6. And then what happens is it will not dilate the blood vessels as much and it will uh, thicken the the lining of the blood vessels. So you have um, uh, less blood flowing and that's the same mechanism of, of strokes, the endothelial dysfunction. And so all of those, you have a direct and indirect link for COVID causing lung uh, problems. And a lot of the, the COVID, you know, a lot of people when they die, they, they're they dying from a bacterial infection. So you wanna make sure also there's less bacteria in the, in the body to not cause the pneumonia that, they're, that they may be dying from. It makes it so simple is that when you, when you describe the process in, in the mouth, you know, it, it's, it's funny how, um, you know, the, the mouth really kind of demonstrates to us what's, what's going on in the body. And, you know, th- this paper really brilliantly, you know, summarizes that in, in a way that, you know, we can understand. I'm just picturing, you know, I, I think if, you know, that it's going to do a lot of, um, you know, help for dental practitioners out there to, to explain it in this very simple way. So I really, um, you know, really encourage practitioners to get out there and read the paper. It, it goes through all the literature out there that, that helps us explain these processes and how we can mitigate these risks in the body. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Molly, you, you mentioned before the test for, um, can you just describe how people can test their own IL-6 and their own LLs for um, for risk? Yeah, so uh, you can find a, a center that uh, can you basically draw your blood, send it to a lab, and they can test to see what your IL-6 levels are. And then there's another one where you, it's a salivary test where you spit and send it to like a lab such as oral DNA. And they will tell you if you have a, 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 a here, let me, I have a slide on it. Basically you could be a GG, uh, GC or CC. Those are the different alleles. So um, you'll, you'll know exactly if you're uh, susceptible to getting a bad reaction from like COVID. Um, just based on that test. Uh, let, let me see. Uh, I can show that one slide. Do you test this on your patients now? Uh, not every patient. Just the ones that are pretty bad or, or may not be resp- uh, well responsive from. Uh, um, yep. Are you able to see it? Yep. So if you just bring it up to full screen. We- let me see. 
Mm. Are you able to see that? Yeah, we can't read it, but we can. If you describe, okay. if you kind of point to it, yeah. So this is the the report, and yep. it's showing that this person has a GG or a high risk of IL six. Says this individual's IL six is GG results in high risk, um, and then it tells you the significance. And uh, you know, there are you know uh, uh, higher chances when you have this high risk of having other bad bacteria of AA and P. gingivalis and T for synthesis. So um, it's good to check kind of the bacteria in your mouth along with this at the same time. It's, it's, it's a simple test, isn't it? And it, it brings us back to, um, you know, that, uh, you know, closer, closer diagnosis, self-diagnosis. And also, you know, doctors can do this, right? Like, yeah. like would you, would you, um, you know, recommend doctors, you know, if we were doing these kind of tests, we would, especially, you know, saliva, but also bloods as well. Obviously they are doing that, but then um, understand that link between periodontal disease and um, lung infection as well. Yeah. Dr. Malayam, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you for sharing us with us your um, all your, your your knowledge, your patient experience, and thank you for the time to write this paper. You know, I think it's it's very timely, but also I, I really think it's going to help progress this conversation. Just some of the things we talked about really brought up some very simple yet very effective ways for people to understand this mouth-body yeah. connection. For those wondering, where, where can they find you and where can they they read more about you? Yeah, um, I'm on Instagram. Uh, my handle is uh, dental surgeon, just dental surgeon straight. And um, I'm going to be publishing actually a part two to that paper. Um, I just submitted it uh, to the same journal. So um, uh, looking out, uh, look out for that one as well. But yeah, um, uh, just, uh, you know, just inspired by everyone in the world and, and, and the social media and um, it's, it's a really great opportunity as dentists to step up and, and be part of the solution of what's going on right now. Yeah, absolutely. Conversations like these, you know, I, I'm just so grateful to be able to talk to someone with, you know, such knowledge like yourself. So it's, it's definitely, you know, you're, you're doing a great service to, to help people understand this better. And thank you so much for, for spending time with us today and, and, and writing this paper and sharing with all, all your great study. Thank you. Thank you so much, doc. All right. Have a great day. All right. We'll have to talk again soon. Definitely. Definitely.